Excelsior, true believers! You are about to embark upon a journey, a trip to the 70s and 80s, when mighty Marvel Comics ruled over all. The Defenders, Doctor Strange, the Champions, Deathlock, the Submariner, the Incredible Hulk, Kill Raven, the Son of Satan, the Macabre Man Thing, and all your other Bronze Age favorites every week appearing on Defenders Dialogue. Now, here are your guides, Christopher Golden and Brian Keane. Excelsior, true believers. Excelsior, indeed, and welcome back once again to Defenders Dialogue. I'm Brian Keane. I'm Christopher Golden, and Brian, my friend, uh, you know, you did this to me last week when we recorded on the 15th of September. I thought that the episode was going to go up that night. I didn't realize we were recording a week ahead. Sometimes we record early, sometimes we're recording on the day. Um, but, uh, but today, even though this won't go up until next week, today, September 22nd, is your birthday. It is. And what better way to spend your birthday than to discuss man thing? Well, that's exactly it. Um, you know, for you, you know, you and, and my other friends know I'm not a big birthday celebrator. I enjoy other people's birthdays, but honestly, I would forget it was my birthday if you guys didn't remind me. Um, but oh, oh hold if, on. Mary, cancel the cake. Don't jump. <laughs> out of that cake. <laughs> but if if I'm going to do something to celebrate my birthday, talking about comic books with one of my best friends seems like a, as good a way of any to do it. It is. I'm excited. I, and I, I, I do have a question for you, though. Okay. Do you ever feel like if you'd just been born on September 21st instead of September 22nd, you might be the biggest author of all time? No, not at all. Because... Uh, and, and I'll tell you exactly why. You're, you're referring, of course, to our friend Stephen King, uh, who retweeted me yesterday on his birthday. Um, and it, it was a tweet about his birthday and my birthday. And of the 6,000 replies to that retweet to me yeah. and him, um, you see the level of nonsense that he puts up with on a daily basis from the public. <laughs> No, I am I am very happy to have been born a day later and be the second best. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Yeah, there well, you know, look, I mean, if there's ever been evidence of the phrase a day late and a dollar short. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Keen, a day late and a dollar short. <laughs> you know, um not to get off on a on a big tangent, but uh of course, you know, a, as a young man, I was an admirer of a group of authors they called the splatter punks, David J. Scow, Skip Inspector, Joe R. Lansdale, etc. And one of them, I won't say who on the air, but in telling me about the the glory days of the 90s when they were all getting published in paperback, you know, they one of them told me, he, he said, you, you were born 10 years too late. If you had been doing this in the 90s, you, you know, you would have made this amount of money based on the strength of your writing and your popularity. And they gave me a dollar figure that was, that was well over six figures. And uh, I cried and I still cry when I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny and we're, this is not the horror show. So we will move on to the man thing in a second, but I always do find it. Um, I've always found it fascinating that, you know, my first novel came out in 1994, literally like, the same time maybe to the month where the horror publishing sort of mega success collapsed completely. yep <laughs> yep i've written about that actually uh, you you tom piccarelli uh and jf gonzalez all three of you you know published your first first things right as everything collapsed yeah. and you know uh all three of you were able to recoup and go on to have successful careers. But it, it, what I proposed in the essay is what if that hadn't happened, where would they be now? Well, there's a, there's a whole generation actually, if you think about it. I mean, and unfortunately, Jesus and Tom are no longer with us, but there's a whole generation of, uh, of horror writers that, that began to come out at that moment. 
um, who then I think just kind of vanished. Oh yeah. You know, uh, it's interesting. Anyway, that's a, that's yeah, a no, I, I think about that a lot. You know, I, I was publishing at I'm that not time, complaining, but it, by it was way. all I'm happy with, I'm happy with my career. I'm not complaining. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you yeah. should be, you have a, a career that anyone can envy, but I think about it a lot. I, you know, I hadn't published a book by then, but I was starting to submit short stories and I was getting those published. And I think about all the names and the table contents of those old magazines and zines. And I'd say 80% of them just stopped. They're just not around anymore. And it just, it makes you wonder, you know, but anyway, anyway, we're, we're, we're talking about old ghosts here today and what a fine segue and old cars and, and, and listen, Brother, this is, you know, this is my sweet spot. Oh, yeah. I'm like, I, man thing number five and number six, uh, you said last week, uh, you know, one of your favorite stories. This is the man thing story that I want to read. Oh, yeah. This is the stuff. I love this so much. Written by Steve Gerber. Art on both issues by uh, Mike Plug, Inks by Frank Chiramonte. Um, go ahead. Yeah, before we get into it, um, just the two, of the laughing dead. <laughs> two historical points of note that I, that I think we should just briefly touch on. First of all, Night of the Laughing Dead, uh, considered by many critics and historians to be one of Gerber's finest stories, not just in Man Thing, but in, in comics overall, uh, and, and deservedly so. But it's also important to note this marks Mike Plug's debut as an artist on the book. Now, Plug was perhaps better known uh, as one of the creators of Ghost Rider, uh, his long stint on Werewolf by Night and the Monster of Frankenstein. Um, but we could do a whole episode about Mike Plug. You know, well, he got his start studying under Will Eisner. Yes. Um, he worked on Scooby-Doo and, and the old Batman cartoons from Funimation. And then went to comics. Usually it's the other way around. Right. Um, we could do a whole show on him, but yeah, he was, he's a seminal bronze age artist, particularly for hard titles. And believe it or not, this is the first time we've actually had occasion to discuss him here on the show. Yeah. And again, I, I, I just want to point out that, that Gene Colan um, and Mike Plug are probably the most important um, horror artists in the history of Marvel. Yeah, agreed. You know? Agreed. Just as Sal Buscema is synonymous with the Hulk, when people yeah. think of the Hulk, they still think of his his Bronze Age depiction. Uh, when you think of Marvel horror, you think of Colin and Plug. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right, well. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, we open with, uh, you know, as we do every issue, with a recap of the Man-Thing's origin well, uh, but recap is different, Brian, I want to jump in and say this recap is different because in this era of Marvel um, and in DC as well, in this era of of the two comics universes, there was a common trope, which was the the introduction, na introductory narration is the narrator speaking to the character. Right. Um, so basically, the narration is speaking to the man thing here um saying you are this you have done that so in the way to, to recap um and i i always loved that i kind of miss it as 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 a uh as a vehicle for like opening up a comic story i agree i agree and the fact i might have that, to do that you know, in an upcoming lady baltimore go ahead well and the beauty of it is you know if you were reading spider-man in this era Spider-Man himself would be talking out loud while he's swinging through the city, recapping his origin in the first page. Um, not so the man thing, because the man thing is very much a, a passive narrator in his own strip. Uh, you, you get Gerber writing in this this weird second person voice, um, which I forever associate with this title. Um, but the, yeah, the man thing is drawn to a very sad clown who has parked his car along the banks of the swamp. And uh, within, within the, the first artist. two pages of the book, he commits suicide. He shoots himself in the head. Yeah. The art is beautiful. And it yeah. is this thing where you just like, the art is gorgeous. And yeah, there's, 
there's a sad clown in a top hat, like mopily, and, and the long clown shoes walking into the swamp, sitting at the edge of the water, crying. Consider this weeping clown, for example, uh, our narration tells us. What does he feel now as he raises a gun to his temple, as the tears roll down his grease-painted cheeks? Holy crap, Brian, this is such a great story. It's such a great story, and I I want to caution listeners that I, I was giggling a moment ago when I talked about the clown shooting himself. There's a reason for that. Chris, do you remember the, the Marvel Comics Power Record adaptations? No. Where you got... You got the comic book, and it was it was like it was an early days 1970s audio book. It, it was the comic book, and in the back of it was a, a 45 RPM record. Okay, uh, where, I remember they existed, but I never had one. Yeah, you know they they would they would narrate the comic book to you, and you'd listen to it, and you'd learn to read. This was the issue of Man Thing that they <laughs> chose for Power Records, and I, I I remember buying this at Toys R Us. And as an adult, I sit there and I, I think on page two, you've got a clown shooting himself in the head. <laughs> and this is what you give little kids a record of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, and again, yes, we are not laughing about suicide. Uh, we are laughing about how dark uh, this story is and how, look, uh, we find this kind of storytelling, um, this sort of grim beauty uh you know just so incredible uh, you know again like i'm i wouldn't laugh if i retold you the events of uh the devil all the time which i've both read and watched uh, on on netflix the other night which is incredibly grim um but i might laugh while telling you about it because i just am shaking my head about how grim it is right uh, so in any case but yes so yeah, uh, the, the man thing, you know, he he he's too late to save the clown. He arrives after the clown has committed suicide. Again, look at this art. Like this this two thirds of a page panel of the man thing standing over the clown who's dead in the water, and and with with that setback of Ted Salas doing his experiments. Yeah, uh, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. I also want to point out to you, Brian. Here's your opportunity to dis- discuss. Gerber starting to reset a little bit of Ted Salas's origins here. Exactly. Uh, Gerber, it's not completely spelled out here, uh, but what he's working up to is that Salas wasn't just working on a formula that would, I, I God, I can't even remember what, what it was in the original origin. It was, it was going to help feed the world and starvation. Yeah. No. Now it's it's getting rebooted a little bit. Salas was working on the super soldier formula, which, of course, turned Steve Rogers into yeah. Captain America. He was trying to recapture that. Um, but he also finds a suicide note that the clown has left behind. It says to whom it may concern laughter is dead. Futility. Blame Ergon. E-R-G-O-N. Now, the man thing cannot read those words. Uh, but he does remember one word from his past life, and that is funeral. He remembers that humans bury their dead, and so he decides he's going to carry the clown into the swamp, dig a hole, and drop him in. Exactly, exactly. Yep. Um, yeah, I I found this whole thing, um, you know, it's grim, but it's also, every time we think we understand swamp th- uh, man thing, excuse me, look at that Freudian slip. <laughs> it's hard to continue to say swamp and say man thing. Um, every time we sort of think we understand what he'll do and what his motivations are, we learn something new about his uh, his empathy, which is his whole deal is empathy, right? right? Um, right. So he wants to take him off uh, and give him a funeral. He wants to bury him. Um, so we cut away to our old friends, Richard Rory and Ruth Hart, um, a tr- a trying to s- check into a motel, Brian, and finding a very old fashioned uh, reaction to their desire to check into the hotel. That's right. It's the 70s and they're not married. And the proprietor of the hotel is forcing them to rent separate rooms. <laughs> um, so they deal with that. And then 
they see that there's a, a carnival setting up across the street from the motel. Uh, and and they're, they're thinking, hey, maybe we'll do that tomorrow after we get some sleep and recover from our adventures with the fool killer and the bikers and everything else. Uh, but before they can, uh, they see two figures from the carnival. Uh, one of them is the, the head of the carnival. His name is Mr. Garvey. Uh, the other one is uh, Ailey. Alia, A Y L A. I guess I'm pronouncing that right. She's a, a high wire performer. Um, yeah. And she's worried because her friend Daryl, who is in fact the clown who just committed suicide, has, has gone missing. Um, Garvey backhands her for mouthing off, and Richard Rory gets involved, uh, gets the best of the guy. But then what happens? Yeah, this was unexpected for me. Yeah. Because I was thinking Richard Rory was going to be, I wasn't thinking he was a Rick Jones type, you know, that I, I was thinking he was more like uh, um, Harold H. Harold in Tomb of Dracula. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I didn't see him as a guy who would who would not only intervene in this circumstance, but actually uh, prevail in that moment. But he does for a moment prevail. But then because it's a carnival, uh, the carnival strong man. The aptly named Trag <laughs> shows up and uh, he, he does his best Hulk impression. Uh, he tells Richard that he's just going to smash him to death. Um, so Richard and Ruth flee in Richard's van. They take Alia with them. Um, and they, on your birthday. Ayla. Ayla. Is that it? It's A-Y-L-A. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> It's a weird name. <laughs> right, go ahead. I apologize to anyone out there named Ayla. Did I say that correctly? You did, yeah. Bracken McLeod. <laughs> Speaking of weird <laughs> name. <laughs> um, so, yeah, she tells them that, uh, you know, uh, her and the clown were, were once in love, but she betrayed him. And after that, he stopped laughing stopped living he just wanted to die and uh then they come upon him they come upon him sitting there in the swamp which is weird chris because we just saw him kill himself yeah they they come upon him sitting the same way we first saw him sitting right there at the edge of the swamp and then he stands up brian and he gives them a bow and he's in a spotlight that seems to be coming from nowhere yep yep he doesn't answer their calls You know, he just he simply starts walking off into the swamp and this spotlight from nowhere seems to follow him as he goes. Ruth finds the suicide note, you know, but. But as we said, here, here he is still walking around. So they they follow him into the swamp. Right. They Uh, think someone else. They're trying to stop him from committing suicide. Right. But someone else is is following as well. And that is. uh trag and uh the boss of the carnival and they come across daryl the clown sitting in the middle of the road again silhouetted in a spotlight yeah there he he gets up and doffs his hat and begins to do a a clownish dance um in the middle of the road uh trag gets scared because trag the dumbest among them is the only one who seems to notice this ethereal spotlight following him everywhere. Trag swerves and they crash into a tree. Um, and uh, the gas tank explodes as all good car crashes do. Um, the, the little clown stands watching gleefully. He goes off, uh, to talk to Trag, um, wondering where Mr. Garvey has gone. We think at this point that Garvey is dead, by the way. Right. Uh, not so we will learn. And the clown is basically mocking Trag. Uh, Daryl is mocking him and in his spotlight starts to lead Trag into the swamp. That's right. Now, one thing Plug does here, uh, and you can tell the colorist kind of muddled it, but you, you can see if you look closely at the line work, what Plug did. The clown is walking on top of the swamp water. Uh, the, the, like I said, the inks and the coloring kind of muddle that, but Trag doesn't seem to notice this, uh, but he does, like you said, he, he notices that, you know, there's, there's the spotlight and he decides to follow the clown into the swamp. He does. 
Um, now, Chris, I want to pause for a moment. Okay. You're reading these in the collected edition. I'm reading them in the uh, the original format. Um, yes. When we turn the page in this issue, we get to the letters page, oh, which okay. is all about Man Thing issue number one. And the letters page is full of love for Howard the Duck and demands that they bring back Howard the Duck. Now, keep in mind, at this point, Howard's appearances are limited to Fear Issue 19 and Man-Thing Issue 1. And he's in it for a total of maybe 12 panels before he's quote-unquote killed. The The Marvel fans of the 70s were having none of that. The, the page is full of Howard the Duck. And uh, they announce at the end of the letters page that Howard the Duck shall return. I What I love is that I'm sure that they were just like, wait. Is one person, is there one weird person writing all of these letters asking for Howard the Duck? <laughs> um, and I'm sure they were they were taken aback by the uh, groundswell of support. Absolutely. Um, that is not, not the kind of thing that they probably anticipated. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, Richard, Ruth, and Ayla are in the swamp and uh, trying to, they don't see. Uh, they they can hear voices, and Ruth says it sounds like Trag. Um, Ava looks over his shoulder and sees the man thing carrying Daryl. Now at That's this right. point, at this point, they believe Daryl is alive. Um, so they follow the man thing, Bryant, and they see him digging Daryl's grave. Uh, Ava runs to Daryl's aid, uh, only to find out that he's dead. That's right. And then we get probably my favorite part of this issue. Uh, You know, Richard, he mistakenly thinks that the man thing has killed Daryl and he he goes off on him Uh, and the man thing reacts. You know, it's anger aimed directly at you emanating from a man you assumed to be your friend. Why? What did you do? Why does he loathe you so? He Um, voted for Trump. (laughs) <laughs> get out how could you i had almost come to think of you as human it's he says <laughs> but it's it's beautiful it's it's a beautiful scene but then you know when richard kneels over the body of daryl he realizes that he's been shot in the head um and you know but Ayla says, but, you know, we didn't hear any gun go off, and we just saw Daryl alive a few minutes ago. And Ruth very wisely says, you know, I'm beginning to wonder about that. Well, that's it. They're wondering, was it a hallucination? But Ruth is the one who says, or a ghost. But as they're having that conversation, Trag comes uh, storming up out of the swamp, thinking that they're pretending that Daryl is dead. Uh, in order to throw him off the, you know, the trail, um, because he just saw Daryl mocking him moments ago. That's right. To the point where he picks up the corpse by his lapels, uh, and Richard Rory steps in, trying to, uh, you know, to prevent this atrocity from taking place. Trag basically, you know, punches him hard enough in the stomach, and Brian, uh, having a- apropos of nothing completely unrelated to this i just looked at this picture of trag punching richard rory in the gut and it flashed me back to one of the two times that a comic book has made me laugh out loud (laughs) um they were both in the pages of hitman written by Uh garth ennis and in one of the early issues of hitman uh uh, Monaghan, Tommy Monaghan, the hitman, goes up against Batman. Oh yes, I remember that. And Batman punches Mon- Monaghan in the in the gut in a similar fashion. Monaghan throws up on Batman's feet, on his boots, <laughs> and as he's wiping the puke off his mouth, he looks up at Batman and he says, "I bet the Penguin never did that." <laughs> <laughs> So that has nothing to do with anything we're discussing, but that panel brought that moment back to me. And uh. <laughs> no, Hitman's a great book, and it's been years. I need to go back and reread that. That's that's uh, probably do a reread. Yeah, the um, only the only comic book that's ever made me laugh out loud while reading uh, yeah. twice. But anyway, 
So, yeah, the man thing, uh, you know, even though Richard Rory's mad at him, he the the narration tells us he knows Rory is is a good man and uh, Trag's assault upon him enrages the man thing. Uh, so they get into a fight. Um, now, it's important to note, whatever knows fear burns at the man thing's touch. But Trag doesn't know fear. He's the strongest guy in the carnival. Um, he thinks he can take this muck monster. He is not afraid. And so the man thing, unable to rely on on that special power of his, uh, has to just resort to physical, blunt violence. Um, and he's just about to win. He's drowning Trag in the swamp. When suddenly, Chris, what happens? In classic DC's dead man fashion, uh, the ghost of Daryl rises up out of his corpse. Um, this is so cool looking. I mean, the art is so great. Um, uh, you know, if you're a person who normally only listens to this podcast, I urge you to go and and uh, look at the YouTube version that Brian will eventually post. Yep. Um, this art is terrific. Um, and they say to the ghost, what do you want? Uh, he says, I want to make you laugh. I want smiles and guffaws and grins and good cheer. And most of all peace. Um, we're going to have a little show, my friends, and all of you are going to be the actors. We're going to play out the story of my life and death with the swamp as our stage and my soul at the mercy of the critics. Um, which leads us into man thing number six called. And when I died, same creative team, Brian, that's right. Uh, so we pick up right where we left off and, uh, we get a, a gorgeous, uh, double page, uh, three quarter splash and a stage has appeared in the middle of the swamp. Um, and on it stands Trag, the man thing, uh, Richard, Ruth, and, and whatever the hell her name is. <laughs> and there are three people sitting on bleachers watching, three hooded figures. Uh, and the clown tells us they are the critics. On their verdict rests the fate of his soul. Yeah, so no pressure for your performance there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so this is what's happening. Um, in a nutshell... Uh, the clown then uses some magic, presumably drawn from the fact that they're at the nexus of all realities, to transform our characters into um, the kid who was the local bully, the girl who was his best friend, to Daryl himself as a kid, to Daryl's mom. And the man thing represents the demon Daryl always felt was inside him, sort of driving him to make certain uh, choices in his life. Right. Um, yeah. And then Mr. Garvey stumbles up and he's the last player. He's going to play the part of Daryl's father. That's right. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's where we begin. And then the the scene in the swamp shifts and we are at. Young Daryl's home, the year is 1944, uh, and his father, Milo, we find out is some kind of banker, uh, and his his mother, Zoe, and then, of course, little Daryl, and they're uh, having family breakfasts. Yeah, family breakfast, uh, and Daryl's father... Uh, does not approve of Daryl's interest in the circus. He wants to go to the circus, but the father says circuses are dirty, Daryl fit for animals only. Basically he wants Daryl to grow up and, uh, and, and be a success like his father. The father is making all of his efforts to become rich, uh, so that he claims so that he can pass that wealth on to young Donald. I mean, Daryl, um, and, uh, Daryl is so angry at the, the way that his father dismisses his interest in the circus. And he says, all you know how to do is count your money. Papa, can you hear me through that paper? Because his father's reading the newspaper in front of his face. And the man thing is there to be the, uh, the empathetic uh, demon on his shoulder. 
and young Daryl picks up the bowl of oatmeal or whatever the hell he's eating. And he's eating hurls- pep cereal, according to the box on the oh, table. Okay, there you go. And hurls it at his father's face uh, behind the newspaper. Yep. Um, and, you know, his, his father raises his hand to strike him. Um, and he, he hesitates. And then Daryl goes outside to sit on the porch, uh, leaving the, the mother and father alone. And the father says, you know, he, he's not normal. What's wrong with him? I don't think he wants to be rich. He's a sick lad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No you problem. Know, Comics, folks. Yeah, but then we get a, a, a very telling moment. You know, Daryl is sitting on the porch looking very sad, and he says, nobody else is laughing. Why should I be able to? Maybe he's right. Maybe I am stupid and selfish. And then his buddy, Betty, Betty Joe, comes running up. That's a dumb thing to say, Daryl. You're not anybody else. You're you. Let's go for a walk. Maybe it'll cheer you up. So they go for a walk. They run into and, you know, now any 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 more lines from Daryl that we read, I'm going to have to read in Forrest Gump's voice because this whole scene reminds me of Forrest and Jenny. Yeah, there you go. OK, Betty Joe, we'll go for a walk. <laughs> well, we're walking. How come I'm still not happy? Did you ever feel like Forrest Gump and that character from Sling, Bra- Sling Blade are basically the same guy? They are pretty much the same guy. Alternate universe versions. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Anyway, uh, the bully punches Daryl in the face. He's bullying him. And then he sees the look in Daryl's eyes. Now he can't see the quote unquote demon man thing looming behind him, but he can see the demon in his eyes. And he's like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have punched that kid in the face. And he goes off, uh, definitely not, uh, not wanting to mess with Daryl anymore. Right. And at that point, the curtain falls from out of nowhere. A curtain falls over the swamp, signaling the end of act one of this play. And the three hooded critics applaud. Exactly. Uh, and they, they turn back briefly to themselves uh, so that they can share their fear. Trag says, I'm, that's crazy, boss. I'm scared. Nobody can do what he did to us. It ain't natural. That's true, Trag. It ain't natural. Um, you know, Garvey is uh, impatient, uh, and the ghost of Daryl the Clown. I think that should get its own title, the ghost of Daryl the Clown. That's a, <laughs> uh, turns to the critics, the hooded critics. Have you seen enough? They say no. So we move on to act two. That's right. Uh, it is Daryl is now 16 years old, uh, and we are at a funeral home. Um, and we find out that his father has indeed passed. Uh, and Jenny, I mean, Bobby Joe is trying to console him. Um, and you know, she's, she's telling him that he has to go in, uh, that this is his father and she owes him. And, and Daryl tells her, you know, that's all I ever heard when he was alive, how much I owed him. I think he had it down on paper somewhere in dollars and cents. Um, so he, he does go in though. Uh, he sees his dad in the coffin and uh, he starts cracking jokes over over his corpse. He, here's, hey, Betty Joe, look, they got him to smile. He had to be dead before his face could go that way. Gee, Dad, you're cute, he says to the corpse. Yep. But his mother rips him a new one for that. Um, and he decides, oh, you know what? Maybe I am a crazy person and I need therapy. So he goes to a psychiatrist. And and this is classic, Brian. I love the names that Gerber comes up with. The psychiatrist is named Dr. Laszlo Schacht. <laughs> Played by Trag. Um, Played by Trag. Exactly. Yeah, and and he uh he he says the mind is like a scroll, Daryl. We'll know if you are sane when we see what is written upon your scroll. And then he he does something akin to the vision where he, he reaches into Daryl's mind um, and he pulls out the scroll uh, and it's a, a portrait of a tortured soul, obviously in turmoil over a multiplicity of moral and emotional crises. So uh, that's the end of act two. And uh, 
the clown turns the the ghost of the clown turns to uh, the judges, the critics, and says, uh, "That's not enough, is it? You're going to make me play it through to the last act." And they say, "Yes." And we cut to 1968, the day well, after. Before, before we cut to 1968, okay. now we're at the letters page. Uh, the oh. letters are supposed to be about Man Thing issue two, in which Howard, all about Howard the Duck. Yeah, Howard the Duck does not appear in Richard in issue two. <laughs> the letters are still about Howard the Duck. Man, here's 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 an example. Dear bullpen, Man Thing two was pretty good, but where was Howard the Duck? <laughs> <laughs> I imagine I, I God my I can imagine Gerber's response. You know, <laughs> thrilled that everybody wants him to do a Howard the Duck comic, but also like, yeah, but there's Man Thing too. Like Man <laughs> Thing's good. <laughs> so yes, now we come to Act Three, 1968, uh, the day after Robert Kennedy was shot, and the day Daryl went looking. For the circus, uh, watching the assassination um, made him decide that he wasn't young anymore and his life had been a waste and he was going to go to the circus. He wants to be a clown. Yeah. Mr. Garvey doesn't have any need for clowns at the moment. He says the public ain't buying clowns this year. Mac, get lost. But Ayla steps in. Uh, she's an aerialist, an acrobat. And she uh, she basically says her father was one of the best clowns. She could teach him. Uh, and. She thinks that the, the show will need a clown. And because Garvey uh, is attracted to Ayla, uh, he goes along with this plan. Um, Daryl Daniel, which is his full name, does join the, the circus and he loves it. He was a smash. They laughed. It made him feel good about himself for the first time in his life. It made Ayla proud of him. Uh, and he was getting pretty close to Ayla. They were starting to fall for each other. And Garvey did not like that. No. Now, Garvey and Trag have figured out that Daryl is a millionaire, you know, an eccentric millionaire who 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 wants to join the circus. Uh, you know, and, and Garvey says to her, he says, you know, we got what we needed from him, his money and an act that draws, um, you know, and and he's he's implying that they don't need him anymore. They've got his money and, and you know, uh Daryl, you know, he, he overhears this and he says, good old inner demon. It told me what to do. I kept the money flowing. So Garby didn't dare fire me, but I changed my act and made it evil. Yeah. He, he actually thinks he overhears this conversation with Garby and Ayla and he, and he thinks Ayla is not his friend and doesn't have any love for him and that she has been part of this plan all along to just milk him for his money um, when in reality she did care for him quite a bit. And, uh, so yeah, he, he says his act has turned evil and she pulls him aside and says, your new act is frightening the customers, Daryl Garvey's worried. And so am I what's wrong. That's right. Uh, he tells her, you know, tell Garvey, you can't buy laughter, but he couldn't keep it forever. The act was scaring him too, showing him a part of himself that he hated. Uh, there was no reason to go on living, so he did what we we what we saw at the beginning of this episode, and uh, that's where the play ends. And he turns to the critics, and uh, they finally reveal themselves. They they throw off their their robes. They reveal themselves to be agents of heaven, hell, and the realm between, and they're going to judge his drama, his life, a mortal and artistic failure. Um, and they basically say you have not shown sufficient motivation for your crime of suicide and thus being neither good man nor bad yet showing no sign that time in my realm would change you time in, in limbo would change him. They consign his soul to total death oblivion. He's not welcome exactly. to heaven, hell or the space in between. Exactly. Uh, which is, is, pretty frightening if you actually think about it from a metaphysical standpoint um and and richard you know he he, he pleads daryl's case he says look you can't do this i lived his life i can vouch for him his soul doesn't deserve to perish 
Uh, the demon lashes out at Richard with uh, a trident that's curiously similar to Dam- Damon Hellstrom's. Um, and the man thing is like, no, fuck that. You, you don't go after after Richard. Um, and he attacks the demon. Yeah, and then we have uh, the battle that we've been waiting for. We didn't know we were waiting for it, I think. Between right. Man Thing and Agents of Heaven, Hell, and Limbo. Um, although they try their best, the Man Thing is getting the better of them. Um, he says he care, He doesn't care, let's see. Uh, what he feels, though not in these terms, is an injustice is about to be, to be committed. He doesn't care why or in whose name. He's aware only that a soul he has touched and which touched him has been placed in mortal jeopardy. And that awareness fills him with rage. That's why he's fighting this fight. Right. Uh, But then Ayla, say it. What's her name? Ayla. Ayla. I don't I don't know why I have a mental block over this woman's name. Thank God Marvel didn't use her. (laughs) Uh, She tells them, you know, look. I'm the reason Daryl took his own life because I never had the courage to defy Garvey and to tell Daryl that I loved him, love the soul that you want to destroy. If you must have a soul, take mine. Yeah. And so this is the moment where uh, they realize that she had love for him, that she found that he was worth loving. And it's that that tips the balance. Um, and and because of that, because his soul was worth loving, uh, it is the agent of heaven who extends his sword toward uh, Daryl. And presumably Daryl's soul goes off to uh, the pearly gates. That's right. And that's where we end. Uh, but we, we should mention that uh, as we end, Daryl's corpse is smiling. Ruth points out, just like Daryl pointed out the smile on his father's corpse, Ruth points out that Daryl has a smile on his face in death. Um, and and then Gerber takes it one step further uh, as Ayla suggests he does. That, the, <laughs> that the emissaries of heaven, hell, and the place in between finally understood that a man who can inspire laughter and joy is the holiest man of all. Um I'm not sure I agree with that, but, you know, <laughs> but, but OK, we'll take it. We'll take it. So, Chris, I know that when we started Man Thing, you were wanting a horror book. And over these two issues, you've gotten that. We got back to horror. We had a, a great ghost story. Uh, but throughout this run, we've had high fantasy. We've had science fiction. We've had supervillains. We've had spycraft. Uh Next issue, we get into some of the weirdest shit yet. Uh, when Man Thing becomes the prisoner of the conquistadors. Yeah, I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Brian, I'm open. I will take these stories as they come, and I will I will share my reaction to them as I experience them. All I can say is that these two issues are. The, you know, again, it's not that I don't enjoy the other Man Thing stories. It's not that I won't enjoy the Man Thing versus the Conquist stories that comes next. Uh, but these are the stories that, to me, are what I go to this book for now. Yep, classic, classic, classic stuff. Night of the Laughing Dead. Uh, it should be pointed out, and maybe we'll cover it at some point. Um, Gerber actually wrote a sequel to this two-parter. Really. Uh, Plug illustrated it, um, but then Gerber left Marvel, and it got put in Jim Shooter's drawer and remained unpublished until uh, just a few years ago, long after Gerber's death. Mm. Uh, Tom Brevoort actually managed to you – know, I, I know Tom is not the biggest fan of mine, but Tom, credit where it's due. You got that thing published, um, so I, I have a copy here. Maybe we'll get into that uh, down the road after we finish this initial run. All right, that sounds good. All right. Well, listen, once again, my friend, happy birthday to you. Uh, I I hope the rest of your day is at least as much fun as talking about ghost clowns and the man thing. I'm uh, I'm debating because it's my birthday. Do I just want to go back to work 
which will not be as fun as talking about ghost clowns and the man thing, or do I want to finish binge watching Cobra Kai, which is the new thing that brings me joy. <laughs> I am uh, uh, halfway through season two. of Cobra. Yeah. Kai. I'm halfway through season two as well. Yes. And yes. I, I love it. I, I, I think it's one of the most clever reboots I've ever seen because they flip the script uh, just using footage from the original Karate Kid movies. They completely changed the audience's perspective on the events that happened, and yeah. I, I love it. I think I think it's really, really I, clever. I think it's great. It's super entertaining, and what I like about it, I think, the most is that just when you think you understand characters on the show, they then undercut everything you thought you knew. Yep. Um, and that goes for almost all of the characters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, somebody, I can't remember who, but someone on Twitter, I was talking about the show, and they said, you know, when we were young, watching the Karate Kid movies, you know, we all very clearly thought Daniel was the good guy and Johnny was the villain. Um, and in watching Cobra Kai, you're not so sure about that anymore. Well, I mean, I, I certainly think that in the in the context of the original film, that is true. That Daniel definitely is the good guy. Johnny is definitely the villain. But now seeing it from Johnny's perspective, you have sympathy for, look, it's like Andrew Vox always said, you know, you can sympathize with how the monster becomes a monster. But once he's a monster, that's a whole different story, right? I'm well, see, what I, what, what I love is the monster's efforts to make amends yeah by being a better sensei and what he does is just creates more monsters yes exactly you know? Which is not, but then he he starts to see that that's what he's doing and now he's like trying to you know leaven that you know right i don't know it's i love it i'm really enjoying it um you know along with kim's convenience it's one of the things that i watch to escape from everything going on in the world you know <laughs> if you haven't seen kim's convenience Starring Simu, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Simu Lu, who's going to be Shang-Chi. Right. Uh, it's a wonderful entertainment and uh, wholesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. All right, my friend. Well, give me an Excelsior for my birthday. That's what I want for my birthday. Naturally. Excelsior, true believers. Oh, that was, Happy boy, birthday. that got me right here, Chris. We'll see you next <laughs> week, folks. Oh. Before we go, I just want to remind folks, our engineer, our our wonderful engineer, Matt Wildeson, who makes Chris and I sound good every week, he's got a brand new book out right now. Uh, he's also got several other books in his backlist, you know, because Matt is, is doing the professional author thing now. He's building up that backlist. Uh, if you enjoy this show, which we give to you for free every week, Maybe go to Amazon, maybe type Matt Wildeson, W-I-L-D-A-S-I-N in the search bar and buy one of his books. I, I heartily endorse that recommendation. Absolutely. All right. We'll see you next week. Defenders Dialogue. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. Defenders Dialogue is written and produced by Brian Keene and Christopher Golden. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wildeson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. 